Hello, in this video, I will be talking about how we discover new drugs and test them for people with breast cancer. Before I do, I'd love to invite you to subscribe to our channel. We put new content out about three times a week, so there's always something new to learn. So when we get a new drug, and maybe you're wondering how do we test that drug and how do we find new drugs? There are loads of new anti-cancer therapies, whether it's hormonal therapy or targeted therapy or chemotherapy or different combinations of them. How do we go about testing them? Well, I'm not going to start with animal studies and all the things that are done before we move into the clinic. But once we do move into testing these medications in people with cancer, what we generally do is start with people who have advanced disease. And as we get smarter and smarter about treating breast cancer and other cancers, we now are finding that not everybody is eligible for every study. So we're looking at treating tumors in a very precise and specific way. And as I've mentioned before, and you may have seen the video, breast cancer isn't one disease. It's actually quite a few different types of disease, and each treatment responds differently to different medications. So for example, and this we've talked about a lot, you can watch our other videos, we don't use endocrine therapy or hormonal therapy in people whose tumors don't have hormone receptors. So actually, tamoxifen was the first targeted therapy we ever had more than 40 years ago. Now there are other targets in breast cancer and other cancers that we're able to target. And most of those are tested in people with advanced disease for a very specific reason. Actually, two reasons. The first is that we can see the disease. So in people with advanced disease, we can measure it in other parts of their body and we can watch it shrink in response to treatment. And there are a couple different things we like to look for. One is a complete response where we can't see any evidence of the cancer. Another is a partial response, which for three-dimensional lesions or spots of cancer, we like to see, we measure the volume of the lesion and then we'd like to see it decrease by more than half. So that means it's a partial response we like to see stable disease. Of course, we'd love to see it shrink in everybody with every drug, but if the cancer that was growing stops growing, we call that stable disease. And what we do is we add together the proportion of people who had a complete response, plus the proportion of people who had a partial response, plus the proportion of people who had stable disease, and add that all together in something we call clinical benefit. So again, in people with cancer that's not treated, it will progress and get bigger. And the areas that we measure on CAT scans or MRIs, usually CAT scans, will continue to grow. So if we can see those stop growing from a particular treatment, that's a benefit, right? But I obviously all of those would be a form of clinical benefit. So in people with advanced disease where we can measure a lesion in the liver, or the lung, or the bone, the bone is a little harder to measure, we get to see the tumor shrink or stay stable. And that tells us that we've got an active drug here. Okay, here's something that's working. And again, we're very specific now about who we uh, enroll in the trial because we want to make sure that the treatment we're using is specifically targeted for that kind of cancer. There are other things that we look for in a given person as well that I'll talk about in just a moment. But if you treat people who've had surgery and then you're giving them treatment with curative intent, many of those women won't have their cancer come back. And so if I were to treat a thousand women like that with a particular therapy, many would never have had a recurrence. So it's, it takes thousands of people for us to see if this treatment is decreasing the risk of recurrence. And that's especially in the case of people with low risk disease. So people with very small tumors that are node negative, that are maybe estrogen receptor positive. It can take a long time for us to have enough people have a recurrence in one group versus the other. And some studies even have three groups 
for us to say there's a difference between the groups, that the newer treatment is as good as or better than the other treatments. So in advanced disease, we can watch it shrink. There, everybody has disease and we can watch the disease decrease in size and number of spots, for example, and that will give us a signal that it works. Then we move it usually into the preoperative setting. So we give primary systemic therapy to somebody with a larger tumor where we know they're gonna need systemic therapy and they, we know it's reasonable to give it before surgery. We can watch the tumor shrink and that gives us a signal that we have a treatment that's now working in the curative setting. And then we'll move that drug or the combination of drugs into the post-operative or adjuvant setting where we're giving treatment to people with no evidence of disease. Then the other thing to know is if the treatment's well enough tolerated, it may get moved into the prevention setting in people at high risk. So tamoxifen, which has been studied for a very long time, is extremely effective in, a, in prevention in higher risk women, whether it's by virtue of their age or because they have a benign lesion that increases the risk of breast cancer. And although we know there are serious side effects, we also know breast cancer is serious and a lot of people are motivated to prevent breast cancer. So we go from advanced disease to giving it before surgery in people who have a big enough tumor to giving it to people after surgery and then a certain some drugs that are well tolerated and that can be taken for quite a while are given as a form of prevention. I mentioned there were a couple reasons that we look at people with advanced disease first. In addition to being able to watch the disease shrink, people with advanced disease have often had other treatments. We have very good treatments in breast cancer. They are not good enough, but they are remarkably effective. And we don't want to put somebody on a new treatment if they haven't had a chance at treatments we already know work. And we don't want to do that in people with curable disease because we kind of have, well, we have a shorter time period in which to give treatment. And the other reason is that people with advanced disease often feel sick from their cancer. And we can look at, is this regimen better tolerated than the cancer itself? So a lot of people talk, you know, put comments in that they're not going to get a certain treatment. And that's because you're concerned about the side effects. People with advanced disease have symptoms from the cancer or they know it's there and they want to do something. So they tend to be more willing to try new therapies to improve their survival and their quality of life. And we see those folks for really the rest of their lives, as long as they're on treatment, we will continue to see people. And so we're not imposing an additional burden in terms of blood draws, scans, or numbers of visits. Okay, so we talked about why we test in advanced disease, then we move it into the preoperative setting, then into the postoperative setting, and then we move into prevention. We generally don't use IV medications for prevention for lots of reasons. One is cost, another is acceptability to you because you're trying to live the rest of your life. And also because of um, just the, the hassle for you and the healthcare utilization that that would take on the healthcare side. We talked about people side effects, that there, people are more willing to get side effects if they're living with measurable disease that they can see in their body. People being treated for cure are also willing to tolerate side effects, right? This is kind of your one shot to cure this, so you want to go ahead and do that. When we start new trials, we are very fastidious about collecting information on how you're feeling, side effects you have, your overall quality of life. I will tell you that most studies looking at quality of life have not used that quality of life information to make decisions about whether a drug gets approved. Usually the drugs that cause shrinkage of the cancer, it's the shrinkage of the cancer and improvement in survival where the cancer doesn't, the time you're living with cancer where it doesn't progress that has trumped quality of life because we can make changes to the drug dose or the schedule or the drugs we give it with 
and improve the quality of life. And also quality of life hasn't really made a big difference in whether people are willing to stay on a medication and their functional status. So although we care about your quality of life and you do too, most drugs have not gone to approval using quality of life information, in part because as the cancer responds, people tend to feel better. Side effects that are really severe and toxic short run tend to be found very early in phase one studies. Phase one studies are being done to see if the drug is tolerable, if it's effective compared to placebo, which we don't usually do in cancer care, and to look at the maximum tolerated dose. What's the biggest dose of this drug that we think is active that people can tolerate without getting sick? So I think one reason quality of life results haven't played a big role in what drugs get approved is because really severe side effects tend to make drugs not even eligible to move forward into clinical trials like phase three studies. I've covered a lot in this video. I hope it's been helpful. Drop a comment or question below if you've participated in a trial. Why did you decide to do that? What was your experience? What was it like being followed so closely by not just your doctor, but a research person? Let us know. And as always, you can follow us on Instagram. You can click like and don't forget to subscribe.